When Snapchat was hitting a new wave of popularity back in 2017, I was just one of the guys who hopped on the trend at first, but I ended up using it a lot. It was the way that everyone seemed to be connecting with each other at the time. I was able to keep in touch with friends I didn't usually get to see. Sometimes I met new people on there, and I could find out what was going on around town on any particular night, just by looking at the stories people posted, which was a great tool to have when you live in a small town like Carrollton, Georgia. But honestly, 90% of the times I opened the app was just to snap my girlfriend, we were both very busy with our lives but wanted to stay as close as we could, so we would snap each other basically all the time. It did more than save the relationship though. I can all but say without a doubt that it saved a life. Years later, I still think about how crazy this was, and how it all started out from a very mundane set of circumstances. I was at home, working on a kinesiology case study when I got a snapchat from my girlfriend. It was just a car selfie with no caption, but that was what most of our snaps back and forth were, just so we could see each other's faces I guess. I took a quick selfie on my own and sent it back, then tried to go back to see what I was working on. But within about 30 seconds, I got another one from her. This time she was in a line to check out at the grocery store, taking a selfie over her shoulder at the people in line behind her. There still wasn't a caption, so I was a little confused as to why she showed me the random strangers that were just going shopping. So I sent back a confused selfie with the caption asking what she was saying. The next snap was of her walking through the parking lot to her car, but this time she said she was on her way to see me. I smiled and looked over at the picture of her for a few seconds before it expired, but then at the last second, I noticed something disturbing in the background. There was a creepy man walking behind her, clearly checking her out. I immediately snapped her back telling her to call me right away, but despite us going back and forth for a few minutes, there was all of a sudden, no reply. I then tried calling her, which I guess I should have done in the first place, but she didn't pick up. She also hadn't opened my message yet, so I assumed she was talking to a friend or too busy driving to use her phone. I knew she was on her way to my place, so I decided to forget about it and tried to get some work done before she arrived. At that point, I ended up getting a little too focused on what I was doing because before I knew it, over half an hour had gone by. And then out of nowhere, I had finally gotten a notification from my girlfriend, except she hadn't really replied to me. It was her sharing her snap map location with me, but the odd thing about it was that she was nowhere near my house. She was almost in Atlanta, which was at least a 45 minute drive from Carrollton. I was very confused at this point, and I had a bad feeling about it, so I replied right away, urgently asking her why she was 50 miles away in Atlanta. There was a full minute of no reply in which my anxiety started to fester. She finally replied with a snapchat, I opened it up, unveiling one of the most disturbing, <gasps> blood-curdling pictures I had ever seen in my life. It was a selfie of my girlfriend crying, with the caption of the most gut-wrenching single word I have ever read saying, Kidnapped. That's when I began to lose my mind. I couldn't register what was going on or what logical thing to do next, as my stupid brain didn't think to just call the cops immediately. Instead, I tried to keep the communication going with her over Snapchat. I begged her to tell me that she was joking, but then the next picture made my heart sink even further. She had the camera pointed to the side, showing her in the passenger seat of her own car, with that same creep from before in the driver's seat. In the caption, I could almost hear her voice saying it from the look of fear in her eyes. It read, Don't let me die. I paced around my room in a panic, racking my brain, trying to figure out what to do. I said I was going to get help and told her to keep opening Snapchat whenever it was safe for her to do so. That way her location would keep updating. Then at last, I called the cops and told them exactly what was happening. They took it seriously, notifying all the Atlanta police departments about the kidnapping in progress. And within a few few minutes there were cops from Carrollton at my door to coordinate my information about her location with the officers that were in the right area to find her. The police ended up tracking them down to an empty parking lot behind an abandoned church in the greater Atlanta area. My girlfriend says that the way the cops swarmed in on them all at once was both awe-inspiring, but almost as scary as getting kidnapped to begin with. 
the man who kidnapped her was taken into custody and thankfully denied bail until he was eventually convicted and thrown in prison to rot for a couple decades. Unfortunately, that hasn't been enough to help my girlfriend from being traumatized about it ever since, and I don't blame her one bit. I've never stopped beating myself up for not going about it better either. I always think of ways in which I could have maybe stopped it from happening in the first place, or at the very least how I could have lessened the amount of time she had to be trapped with that psycho. Of course, we are both very glad that the snap map feature exists. If it weren't for that easily accessible way to see and send the phone's GPS location, things probably would have become the worst case scenario. This story was inspired by a case that happened on September 4th of 2017. The image below is the victim in question. The animation pretty much sums up the tragic ordeal. If it hadn't been for the snap map feature, things could have turned left real quick. Here's a mugshot of the culprit in question. Police have since released surveillance footage of the kidnapping in the parking lot. Here's what it looked like. This happened when I was a freshman in college and lived in a tiny two-bedroom house in one of the off-campus neighborhoods with another girl. But in an effort to make friends aside from my roommate, I spent as much time as possible on campus. After classes, I would usually study in the library for a few hours or go to the student gym. Whenever I was at the gym, I would always run into this guy named Justin. I never saw him do any real workouts. At most, he would just walk on the treadmill for a few minutes. It was clear clear that his intention wasn't to exercise, but to lurk around and bother the girls that were there, me being one of them. He would always come up and talk to me while I was in the middle of a set. I would barely acknowledge him, maybe giving him the courteous nod just so he can leave me alone. That's when Justin took it as a green light to start flirting with me, rudely disregarding my workout. I would try to avoid him, but it was clear he never got the message. Unfortunately, during those early days of college, I was in a vulnerable spot, moving away Away from home and going to school made me feel shy, so I didn't have the guts to tell him to straight up screw off like I wanted to. Eventually over time, we started to form this weird friendship of some sort after he asked me for my snapchat a bunch of times. I caved and gave it to him. From then, we would snap each other occasionally, but obviously he was a lot more active in the conversation than I was. I wanted him to lose interest and leave me alone, but for some reason I felt compelled to consider him a friend since I lacked having any. But this would all come back to bite me when I started randomly running into Justin more often. We never made plans to hang out, but he had the tendency to just pop up wherever I went around campus. I avoided him when I could, but he was often able to corner me into un wanted conversations where he would habitually ask to walk me home. I always found some way to decline. There was no way I wanted him to know where I lived. However, by the time I started to realize how creepy Justin was, it was already getting to be too late. One night, at around 2 in the morning, I was woken up by a notification. I would usually sleep through that, but I was having trouble sleeping that night because of all the stress from Justin Loki stalking me, so I rolled over to check it out. To my severe disappointment, it was a snapchat from Justin. I should have left it on delivered for that night, but in a momentary lapse of thinking I opened it. I was shocked. It was a picture of him standing in the bathroom mirror with nothing but a towel, and he was soliciting me with his caption saying, Send a nude? I was so disgusted that I couldn't stomach replying to it, so I left it on red and went back to sleep. A few minutes later, Justin sent me another Snapchat. At this point, I was curious to see how deep he would dig himself into this hole, and what I saw was somehow more disturbing than the mirror picture. It was a selfie of him with tears running down his face. He was actually crying this time. This was more disturbing coming from an adult. The caption read, Why are you leaving me on red? I felt embarrassed just for thinking we could be friends and I was losing my patience. So despite the fact he'd already crossed several lines, I gave him the grace of texting. Please leave me alone. I sent the message and rolled over to sleep. 
That's when I heard multiple Snapchat notifications from Justin, but I ignored them for as long as I could. However, the whole situation was causing me to toss and turn, but without ever getting any good rest. Finally, after about an hour, I gave up and checked my phone. The series of snaps I opened in that moment made my blood curdle. The first one was a picture of his feet up on a public bus with the caption saying he was on his way. But what was seemingly just a harmless back and forth interaction became all the more disturbing when I saw his next Snapchat. It was a snap in front of my house saying he was here. I freaked out and sat up in bed. It was clear he already knew where I lived, but it wasn't over yet. That alone was bad, but it was the third snap that made me know I had to get the police involved. It was a picture looking through a gap between a set of doors. A picture of me sleeping in my bed with the caption, You look so beautiful when you're asleep. In a heartbeat, I sprang out of bed and sprinted out of the room. Right as Justin burst from my closet and started chasing after me, he nearly got me, but I was able to get to the bathroom down the hall and lock the door behind me. A second later, he was banging on the door repeatedly. All I could do was threaten to call the cops, but it seemed like he wasn't going to leave until I surrendered myself. I collapsed with my back pressed against the door as I sat on the bathroom floor, wailing under my breath. I actually couldn't call the cops. I ran out of my room room so fast that I left the phone on my bed. Luckily, my roommate just so happened to be in the other room. She had awoken to the chaos and got up to lock her door and call the police for me. About 10 very tense minutes later, the cop showed up. Justin didn't try to run. He folded and let them take him away, sobbing like a big baby the whole time. Afterwards, I had the conversation with my roommate about how he was able to find out where I lived. The very first thing she asked me was if I left my snap map on. I immediately had the biggest facepalm moment of my life because that's exactly what it was. The snap map was a new feature back then and I wasn't thinking much about it until that moment. However, I also learned how little the college cared about my safety. When the cops ran Justin's background, they found multiple instances of aggravated stalking, yet somehow he was allowed to just wander around campus all the time. This story was inspired by a real life event where a male suspect would use the snap map feature to locate and trace the movements of a female who he had grown an obsession with. When the female started to realize the more random and frequent bump ins with the male, she knew something was wrong and immediately reached out to law enforcement. The male has since been given a restraining order. The person who submitted the story has attached screenshots of the alleged snapchats. When I was in my last year of elementary school, that's when Snapchat started becoming super popular. Pretty much everyone had a Snapchat and was using it all the time. The teachers always acted horrified by us being on our phones so much, but we all thought it was just a cool, fun new thing to play with and didn't see the harm in it. I remember when I used to use Snapchat back and forth with this guy named Richard. He was one of those random people that could just pop up on the app and add you as a friend. These days, everybody knows to be cautious with adding people you don't know, unless you really just care that much about seeming more popular to everyone else. But back then it was different. It didn't feel dangerous to simply text people and maybe trade photos even if you'd never met them in person before. Plus it was really cool that it was a possible way to make new friends that you didn't go to school with. Everybody was randomly adding people and accepting random requests to just have something to do. So, even though I never knew a Richard, I added him back and we started to talk. After a few weeks it seemed like I might have really made a new friend, or at least an online friend, like the modern day equivalent of a pen pal. We had a streak of selfies and we would also send each other whatever other random snaps we took that day. Based on the pictures he sent me and the stuff he posted on his story, I was pretty much certain that he was real and not a catfish. Sometimes, I'd even ask him out of the blue to send me some specific pose in his next selfie, like a peace sign with one eye open, and he would do it, which was how I knew he wasn't just using someone else's pictures. Also, Richard was kind of cute to me and after talking for a little while, 
while, we learned that we were about the same age and lived in the same area, sort of. For a while, there was never any talk about meeting in person, and every day that went by he didn't ask me to come over made me that much more sure he wasn't creepy. Of course, he did ask eventually, and I was almost willing to do it, but even at that age I knew that it would be really stupid to do. Instead, I did something else that was really stupid, and I asked Richard if he'd rather come to my house, since I wasn't comfortable going to the house of somebody that was technically a stranger. He said that was fine with him, and I gave him my address. Dress. But even though we talked about it, we never actually made plans to meet up. We kind of just forgot about it, or at least that's what I thought happened, until one night when I was awoken at 3am because somebody was spamming my phone with snapchats. I finally got up and looked at the notifications and realized they were all from Richard. Confused, I opened them and saw a series of snaps of the outside of my house. They were captions saying stuff like, Hey, you up? Let's hang out. Or, I'm here. Come outside. Right away. I was finally getting that something wasn't right about this, so I didn't respond at first. Instead, I got out of bed and crept up to my window to take a peek outside. My bedroom was on the second floor facing the street, so I could see the whole area and there wasn't a single soul out there except one person. A fully grown man in a hoodie standing outside my house with his white pickup truck parked in my driveway. I knew that wasn't the Richard I thought I was talking to. I stepped away from the window so he couldn't see me, and then I told him off with a few nasty snaps. Leave me alone! You're not Richard, you creep! I was so scared of getting in trouble with my parents, thinking they would get mad at me for talking to strangers on the internet, that I tried to handle the situation myself. I hoped that he would get the message and leave, and while I waited for him to go away, I hid in my bed under the covers. Unfortunately, he persisted and sent me another snap. I opened it, and again, it was an image of my house with the caption, I'm not leaving until you come outside. I still wanted to keep my parents from finding out, so I kept snapping him back trying to reject him, telling him to screw off as harshly as I could. He opened my message, but this time didn't reply. A few seconds passed and I thought for a moment that it had done the trick, but when I started hearing noises outside, I got up and went to my window to look out of curiosity, thinking I would be safe from anything up here on the second floor. But right as I pulled back the curtain, I saw that man right in front of my eyes. In a split second, he punched through the window pane and tried to grab me, but I jumped back just in time and ran away, screaming at the top of my lungs until I made it to my parents' room. My parents got up and immediately came to my aid. By the time we got to my room, there was no sight of the man or his truck. There was just a bunch of broken glass all over the floor and a ladder sitting outside my window. I still can't believe how desperate he must have been to go through the trouble of bringing a ladder and leaning it up against the side of my house just to have a chance to get at me. But for a while, I could never figure out how he was able to fool me with the pictures of that kid that seemed so legit until the police finally finished their investigation on my report and were able to track him down and arrest him. It turns out that the the Richard I thought I was talking to was that man's son. He had been coercing his son to pose for multiple pictures and videos, just so he could use them to put up a front and lure people like myself into thinking he was one of us, and not that nasty old creep he actually is. This story was inspired by a man who would intentionally pose as a teenage boy on Snapchat to prey on the gullible, vulnerable victims he tried to lure in. The number of victims was said to be around 31 individuals in total. He has since been arrested and charged accordingly. <laughs> <laughs>